I'm glad to be with you this morning, glad to be leading you in the Word of God. Pastor Ian already read the text for us this morning, but we're going to look at it again. So if you have your Bibles, take them back out and look to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Uh, we've been making way, our way through this letter, Paul's letter to the Corinthian church, and uh, we're deep into the letter now, nearing the end. And uh, we'll look at it again this morning, chapter 10, or 12, verses 1 through 10. And then uh, next Sunday, we'll have a pause as we'll be celebrating the resurrection of Jesus and then uh, we'll come back after Resurrection Sunday and finish this letter out in just a couple of weeks. But uh, 2 Corinthians 12, 1 through 10 will be our text this morning. As you find your place, let me uh, once again look to the Lord in prayer, ask for his blessing on our time in his word, and then dive into the message. But let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are grateful to have your uh, word open before us. We're thankful that it is living, that it is active, that it is powerful and effective. And we pray that, uh, as you've promised, your word would do its work in our lives this morning. And uh, so make us attentive to it, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, what would it be like, uh, what would it be like for you or for me uh, to receive exceptional revelations or visions from God? Visions from him about his greatness, where God shows up in a dynamic, powerful way like he did to the prophets of old. And you might be thinking, you know, burning bush or angelic messengers or transported to heaven like Isaiah was and sees a vision of God in all of his glory, or maybe just a talking donkey like Balak received. What would it be like for you or me to receive exceptional revelations and visions from God, from him about his greatness on the other hand, what would it be like to receive harassment from Satan, which is painful and persistent and downright debilitating, and it doesn't go away, even with persistent prayer. No exorcism will be successful. Well, Ian read this text for us this morning, and as we read this text, we become aware that the Apostle Paul had both of these experiences both exceptional revelations and satanic harassment. And as we read this, we discover he didn't make much of the visions or the revelations, which is quite interesting, because the revelations and visions he received put him in a very elite audience, if you will, but he didn't make much of those visions or revelations, nor did he fall into defeat or despair or disillusionment over the demonic harassment, which remained with him, even though he asked God repeatedly to remove it. As we're thinking these things through, this puts Paul in a very unique audience. He received revelation from God like the prophets of old did. He also received harassment from Satan, if you will, and three times he asked God to remove it, and it wasn't removed. It might bring up in our minds Jesus Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane, praying three times that God would remove this cup from him, and the answer in both cases was no. Paul had both experiences, grand visions and debilitating weakness, but well, we learn from this letter that Paul's life and ministry wasn't built on those grand revelations, nor was it built on extreme spiritual warfare as he fought off the forces of evil that were arrayed against him. He didn't play that card like maybe so many televangelists would do today. Paul didn't boast about his unspeakable revelations he received in God's presence, nor did he collapse under the painful experience of satanic harassment because Paul's life and ministry was built on a different foundation. It was built on the person of Jesus and the message of the gospel and experiencing God's grace and power in his life through humility and faith. Christ made Paul humble and content and strong. So Paul played down the exceptional visions he received, and he was content, as it says here in the end of the chapter, he was content with weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities, for in his weakness, Christ strengthened him. So we learn something really important here. Neither exceptional revelations, and we might say exceptional subjective revelations that Paul received, nor the objective painful demonic harassment exceeded the sufficient grace of God that is found in being with union with Jesus. What a huge lesson. Paul here recognized the revelations could have made him proud. He recognizes that, and he calls that out in his own letter. He could have been conceited. But he was given a thorn in the flesh by God to keep him humble. And through humility and faith, Paul experienced Christ's presence and Christ's power 
which moved him forward in life and ministry. And so we could go back in this letter, all the way back to the very first chapter, and we would discover that Paul could boast that he behaved in the world with simplicity and godly sincerity, not by earthly wisdom, but by the grace of God. If you were to go back and reread this entire letter, Paul's second letter to the Corinthian church, we would discover that Paul, in this letter, he boasts a lot, or he at least mentions boasting a lot. He boasts in his weaknesses, he boasts in the Lord, he also boasted in what God and the gospel produced in his life which was by grace. So today's message, 2 Corinthians 12, 1 through 10. It's not shining there in the back wall, if you might correct that. But in the context, uh, this, uh, this message, the context is found in chapters 10, 11, 12, 13. Paul is confronting an unhealthy situation that has arisen in the Corinthian church. It's actually a conflictual situation. Uh, there were leaders in the church who were seeking to discredit Paul and undermine recognized leaders. Uh, this group in the church, they were discrediting Paul by claiming he wasn't a great preacher, wasn't a good speaker, he wasn't loving in his leadership, he was bold and aggressive when he was away, but he was a real weakling when he was present. Some even questioned Paul's apostleship because he didn't make much of the visions and revelations that he received. Uh, these people were discrediting Paul, and at the same time, they were attempting to advance themselves. They boasted of their credentials. They exaggerated their importance. They presented their leadership superiority and discussed ways in which they would do ministry different and better. Their practice of undermining the influence of recognized leaders and their not-so-subtle self-promotion is not only dividing the church up into groups, but it's also marginalizing Jesus. As Paul says here in the letter, they were being moved away. As a church, they're being moved away from a pure and sincere devotion to Jesus Christ. So Paul is confronting this in the church, and he's confronting this in the letter. He's confronting this inertia and disunity that this unnecessary division is creating. While this conflict is pulling at the fellowship of the church, it literally has moved Jesus away from the table of fellowship. And it's moved him out into the back porch of irrelevance. And Paul wants Jesus to be back at the table of fellowship, and he also wants to correct these people who are causing division in the church. So our reading this past week is found in the midst of that type of conflict that Paul is addressing, and he's confronting it in his letter. But as he does this, he, he gets pulled into this boasting game. You know, the super apostles that are causing the division back in the church, they're, they're exalting themselves and they're boasting of themselves. And so Paul gets pulled into this boasting game, and in the midst of this boasting, he talks about exceptional visions and revelations, but he also refers to this thorn in the flesh that keeps him from becoming conceited. So let's look at it together. I'll look back at verse 1. We'll read these 10 verses together and give some thought to it as we go through. He says this, I must go on boasting, though there is nothing to be gained by it. I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man. Now, that's an interesting thing. He says, I know a man. Down in verse 6 and 7, we're going to discover that this man is actually Paul. He's speaking in the third person. He's doing that on purpose. He says, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up into the third heaven, not the first heaven, not the second heaven, the third heaven. Interesting cosmology there. Some in that day even thought there were like seven heavens. But this man is caught up into the third heaven, whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know. God knows. It was so real. It was so genuine. I know that this man was caught up into paradise, the very presence of God, the garden of God, if you will. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And this man, he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter unspeakable things. Let's pause there for a moment. Do we know of other prophets who were transported to heaven and received revelations that they could not speak about? Could not write down? Do we know of anyone else like this? Daniel. Daniel chapter 8 and Daniel chapter 12. We also know that this is going to happen to the Apostle John on the island of Patmos as he writes the Revelation, the last book of the Bible. In that, in chapter 10, he says, there's things that I saw I couldn't record. So, so this, Paul is speaking about, he's being transported to the third heaven, into the garden of God, into God's very presence. He sees things, he hears things that he cannot record. This puts Paul in a pretty elite audience. If there's any boasting to be done, he's got a good platform to be boasting. He says in verse 5, on behalf of this man, I will boast. 
But on my own behalf, I will not boast, except of my weaknesses. Though if I should wish to boast, I would not be a fool. It wouldn't be foolish, for I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain from boasting. Why? Why do you refrain from boasting, Paul? So that no one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me, but the Lord said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. So in other words, the answer is no. (laughs) I'm not going to take the thorn away, you can just have my grace. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses. This is the third time Paul said that. He said it in chapter 11, verse 30, chapter 12, verse 5, and now 12, 9. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly, happily of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, I am weak. For when I am weak then I am strong in Christ. All right, let's consider what Paul's saying here. I'm going to give you a little bit of an outline this morning. This will capture some of you. Uh, Some of you learn this way, but follow along in this outline. The visions and revelations that Paul experienced were over the top. This is chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. The visions and revelations that Paul experienced were over the top. They were exceptional. Uh, They were unspeakable, like nothing you or I should ever expect Uh, We know some of the visions and revelations that Paul received because they're recorded in the Scripture. Uh, We know, for example, the vision that he had of Jesus on the road to Damascus when he was going there to arrest Christians. He receives a vision, and ultimately that leads to his conversion. Uh, We read about that in Acts chapter 22 and 26. We know about the vision that Paul received in Asia, that he was to go over into Europe, the Macedonian call. He's supposed to leave Asia and go over to Macedonia and uh, spread the gospel there in Macedonia. We also know of the vision that Paul received while he was in Corinth. God came to him in a vision and instructed him to stay, remain in Corinth for an extended period of time because there was a great door of ministry open to him there, and he was to stay there even though he was experiencing resistance. And so Paul did stay there in Corinth. So we know of some of the visions and revelations that Paul received, but this one that he speaks of here in this text, this exceptional vision of being transported into paradise, which happened 14 years earlier according to this letter, we've got nothing on this one. And again, this is an exceptional revelation. John and Paul received revelations on par with the Old Testament prophets. People like Daniel, Isaiah. That's a big deal. That puts Paul here in a really elite audience. You know, if I were to come along as your pastor and tell you that I received a revelation from God, you all would expect me to start quoting Scripture. (laughs) You wouldn't expect to hear me tell you about some dream I had after a bad night of pizza. Right? If I'm going to give you a revelation that I got from God, you would expect me to be quoting Scripture. Now, Paul, he has this revelation, and it's exceptional. Paul did receive visions and revelations that were over the top, but we also learn from this text that the visions and revelations were not the basis of Paul's ministry. The ministry, the ministry was built on the gospel, and the gospel worked out in Paul's life. And so Paul's ministry wasn't built on this revelation he received, like, hey, let me tell you, I got this thing from God, and boy, you ought to listen to me, and you ought to follow me, and I'm superior to you because God spoke to me. He doesn't play that card. Instead, he tells them the gospel. That was Paul's message. And the gospel changed Paul's life. And so the basis of his ministry is the gospel message and the grace of God and what it produced in him. So Paul says here in this text, I refrain from boasting so that no one will think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. Paul's message is the gospel, and Paul's life is the gospel being worked out in the power of God. And this is what the ministry is built on. Christ crucified. Christ risen from the dead. The risen Christ changing lives. This objective reality overrides Paul's subjective experience or his personal experience. That's important for every church, in every age, in every place. 
I probably should have put this quote on the, on the screen, but I don't have it on the screen. The foundation of the church and the unity of the church is not laid on the subjective revelation that some person received, but on the objective reality of Jesus Christ as proclaimed in the gospel. So this is the first part of the outline. As Paul begins this paragraph, he says, man, the visions, revelations, they were over the top, but they're not the basis of my ministry. The gospel is, and the gospel changing lives. That's what the ministry is built on. He goes on to say in the next few verses, the pain of Paul's existence. That's what I label as the thorn in Paul's flesh. The pain in Paul's human existence was intended to check Paul's pride and keep him humble. Are you familiar with thorn bushes? Are you familiar with thorns? We had a, a bunch of thorn bushes on our property back on 6060 Midland Road where we moved from a year and a half ago. When I was a little kid, we had thorn bushes out in the stand of woods behind our house. As a matter of fact, uh, when I was growing up, we lived in a rural area, and we were surrounded by fields, and uh, my grandfather had a snowmobile, and uh, fortunately for us, he stored his snowmobile at our house, which made Grandpa a really cool grandpa, because we used that snowmobile a lot more than Grandpa did. But uh, we rode that snowmobile all over the fields. But behind our house and behind the, the field behind our house, there was a stand of woods. And then on the other side of that stand of woods, there was a big chain link fence. And somehow there was a hole in that fence that would fit a snowmobile through it. And that took you out onto the Oakland County golf course. Golf courses are beautiful to golf on. They are also beautiful to snowmobile on. And, uh, but in the, in the spring and the summer, thorns would grow up. There was a section of thorns that would grow up in the middle of the woods that we had to pass through. And so every winter after the snowfall, you'd have to get the snowmobile through the thorns. And after a few times through, the thorns would be all bent over and you could get through quite easily. But those first few times through, boy, you huddled really close to the front end of that snowmobile right next to the motor trying to get through all those thorns because they would just grab at your clothes. And remember those old snowmobile suits? They just tear those things to shreds. I had a friend of mine, Roger Whiting, Matter of fact, I built homes with Roger Whiting back before we got married, and then after we were married, still framing homes with Roger. But Roger Whiting, he was a little boy. He was out playing in the woods uh, with his siblings, and uh, he caught a thorn right in his eye, right in the pupil of his eye. And as thorns do, as you know, for whatever reason, they seem to break off easy. And so he got a thorn in his eye, and it broke off there in his eye, and he goes running back to the house. And it's there in his eye, and he could feel it, and his eye's watering, and he's all upset. And so his dad sits him down on his lap, and he says, okay, sit real still. And he gets a pair of tweezers. You guys see that coming out of your eye? And he grabs that thorn, and he pulls it out. Pain was gone, but he was permanently blinded in that eye. As soon as the thorn went out, he lost his vision. So what was painful was removed, but it became a permanent disability. Paul received a thorn in the flesh, which God didn't remove. He left it there. And it became a persistent humbler in his life. Uh, Paul received this thorn in the flesh, which I've called the pain in his human existence. We're never told what the, pain, what the thorn was. He never elaborates on it, other than to say that it was a messenger of Satan to harass me. We learned from the text that Paul pay, prayed persistently that the thorn would be removed. He prayed at least three times, if you will. Interesting, he references that number. Paul prayed that it would be removed. God persistently provided grace. Instead of removing the thorn, Paul received sufficient grace in its place. How do you like that? That's God saying, no, no, it's going to stay right there. Now stay right there. I would argue that grace isn't provided us apart from Jesus Christ. Therefore, in this harassment that Paul is experiencing, whatever it was, the presence and power of Jesus is present and experienced by Paul in such a sufficient way that it is superior to the thorn being removed. And so Paul could eventually say, hey, I'm, I'm now content with this. And ultimately he would say, I'm actually happy for it. Being humbled and having Jesus is being better than being pain-free in the moment. So Paul here is humbled and strengthened by Christ in the midst of this painful experience. There's one more part of this outline, the final part in the final verses, chapter 12, verses 9 through 10. Paul's recognition of his weakness made him all the more appreciative of Jesus 
and his strength. That made Paul contented. That made Paul happy, if you will. The persistent harassment, the persistent thorn kept Paul humble. In humility and faith, Paul experienced Christ's presence and power. And then this one takes us all the way back to the beginning. The strength of Jesus, not the exceptional visions and revelations, moved Paul forward in ministry. That's, that's the real landing place. The strength of Jesus, the presence of power, the presence and power of Christ in his life as a result of his humility and faith, not the exceptional visions and revelations and the experiences that Paul had, this moved Paul forward in ministry. For he ends there saying, for when I am weak, then I am strong. You know, as we reach the end of today's passage of Scripture, let's not forget that Paul is saying what he is saying because of the conflict that is present in the church at Corinth. Paul is boasting here, or he's not boasting, because there are influencers in the church who are exalting themselves with their exceptional experiences. And by the blessing of God on their life, as revealed in the benefits they are enjoying... But in this self-exaltation and self-promotion, they're causing divisions in the church as the church is dividing up over people and positions. And here Paul is responding to this. And in this context, Paul isn't establishing himself on the basis of his exceptional experiences. He could. If anyone could, Paul could have. But Paul is not establishing himself on the basis of his exceptional experiences with Jesus. Nor is he ignoring the reality of his weaknesses. He's not ignoring the reality of his weaknesses. The pain of limited performance because of the presence of the irremovable thorn. He's not doing either of those things. Ignoring his weaknesses or establishing himself because of his exceptional experiences. Boys, I think about this. I know of no Christian leader who doesn't know the pain of limited performance. There's not one. (laughs) I remember years ago attending a a pastor's conference, a pastor's conference with, you know, tons of pastors were present and thousands of them. And of course, they have those top drawer speakers that are going to speak to the audience, right? Because those are the ones that come and speak to the audience. They're they're the top drawer speakers. And I remember listening at that time, it was years ago, Erwin Lutzer, And Erwin Lutzer was the uh, pastor of the Moody Memorial Church in Chicago for years and an exceptional pastor and an exceptional author. And I remember him saying to a group of pastors at that time, like, there's not a pastor in the world who doesn't know the low-level guilt of not meeting all of the congregation's needs. And I'm like, oh, if that's true of Erwin Lutzer, wow, what a strange encouragement. Paul, here in this passage, he's not establishing himself on the basis of these superior revelations. He's not going to boast on them. The only safe place to boast is in his weaknesses. Nor is he ignoring his weaknesses, the pain of this limited performance because of the irremovable thorn. Instead, Paul labored to establish the ministry on the gospel of Jesus Christ and on Christ-like character that Jesus produces in him as he's humble and faithful. So we get to the end of this passage and we understand that personal weakness and Jesus' strength is the only safe ground for boasting. And so Paul's going to plant his flag there. So glad he did. All right, let me end in prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this passage. We learned so much from it. Father, we thank you for the Apostle Paul and his honesty and transparency, even in his writing here. We, we are benefited by it. By it. Father, we thank you for the way that you lead and guide and are the sovereign controller in our lives, giving us all that we need to do what you've called us to do, keeping us humble, keeping us dependent on you. Father, we thank you for the power and the presence of Christ in us, the power and presence of Christ in the church. May we labor as a people here, even in Saginaw, to keep the gospel, to keep Jesus central to our ministries to keep Jesus, if you will, at the table of fellowship by not relegating him to a place of irrelevance, but leaning on him and depending on him and finding in him all that we need for our sufficiency and for our satisfaction. Father, I pray that this might be continually true of us as we labor together in the ministry here in this place. 
Thank you for loving us. Thank you for providing us all that we need for life and godliness through your great and precious promises. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. All right. Well, next week we will not be back in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Next week will be Resurrection Sunday. And uh, I, I'm not exactly positive. I've got some uh, thoughts as it relates to uh, uh, where I'm going. I think I might do something very unique. In the book of 2 Corinthians, even though this book uh, in the early chapters deals with uh, encouragement and comfort, and in the middle it's got sections on giving, and then here at the end he's dealing with a conflictual situation in the church in Corinth. In this book, there are several places where the gospel of Jesus Christ is just put forward in very strong and beautiful language. And so I may use the text for next Sunday's sermon out of the book of 2 Corinthians. And so if you want to, uh, this next week, just sit down and read the whole letter. It's not all that long. You can read the whole letter in less than an hour. And look for, even in these contexts of comfort and encouragement and giving and conflict and conflict resolution, how, how Paul refers to uh, the magnificence and beauty and glory of Jesus Christ and saving a people unto God, and, uh, because it's, it's found in there. So you can do that, and I would encourage you to do that. Following next Sunday morning after Resurrection Sunday, we'll come back into this letter, and we've got literally just a few more weeks left as we're into the latter uh, chapter and a half of this, of this book. It's been good to be together this morning, and I uh, trust that you'll bless and encourage and benefit one another. Tonight will be Awana, youth groups, adult class. Adult class is canceled, so take notice of that as well. Uh, our teacher for that class is ill, not here this morning nor this evening, so take notice of that. No adult class. So tonight will just be uh, Awana and, uh, and youth group. Then also next Sunday morning, I'll, I'll reference this before you go, next Sunday morning being Resurrection Sunday is the day that we have set aside to begin... Uh, contributing ourselves in a financial way toward the advancement of the ministry here. And so for those of you who have that laid on your heart by the Lord to contribute in a financial way toward the advancement of the ministry here, uh, next Sunday we kind of begin that, uh, that campaign, if you want to call it a campaign, where we'll start contributing uh, week by week and sometimes in gifts as it relates to the expansion of our ministry. And uh, so next Sunday, uh, prepare for that as well. We won't mention that next Sunday morning, but uh, uh, this will be the last Sunday for me to remind you of that. Well, it's been great to be together. God bless you. Enjoy one another. Have a great Sunday morning and uh, Sunday afternoon. Lord willing, we'll see you back tonight. God bless you. You're dismissed.